Mr. Smith, uh, a lot of the other top songs of today are about sort of abstract things, and you sing about uh, broken homes and uh, songs about prostitute sons, very real type thing. How do you account for the fact that these things are successful sometimes? Well, I think that uh, even though, in my opinion, the world is in a terribly confused state, people uh, still want to hear the truth sometimes. That's my thing, the truth. You know, and that's what I look for in a song. I uh, try to find songs that uh, talk about real life, things that um, people can associate with, whatever the storyline is, love, lost, love found, but something that relates to life. A lot of your songs are sort of depressing. Uh, if you walked up to someone and said, how would you like to try to sell a song which is about someone who has lost his wife and he's missing her very much and telling the world about it, uh, you wouldn't think that something like that could sell a million, but a year ago this week, Honey was the t at the top of the charts. Well, although uh, Honey, to a degree, is depressing, uh, to the degree that uh, she's dead, and uh, he's missing her. But the beauty in it also is that uh, he remembers her uh, with uh, the feeling that uh, he talks about in the song. So it's depressing, I think, to a much lesser degree uh, than it is beautiful, really. Uh, that's Life, the song that uh, Frank Sinatra had uh, the really big hit record on, was the first record that I, that I really made some noise with myself. You're speaking about Frank Sinatra. One of the things that he has said in interviews in uh, magazines and so forth is that his start was with the big bands and he wouldn't trade that experience for anything in the world. Mm -hmm. You're one of the few younger singers around today, very popular, who had quite a bit of experience, in this case with Count Basie. How do you think that has affected you as compared with, say, if you had been singing for three years backed by three guitars and a drummer or something like that? Actually, uh, I think... Uh Working, I, you know, uh, as as long as you're practicing your your craft, you know. I was with Basie for three years, and uh, uh, that was certainly a good and valuable experience for me. It was in the beginning of my career, and I'm thankful that I had that chance. I think um, more than anything, uh, the uh, experience, you know, traveling uh, with uh, a master. You know, Basie knows the world, you know, like, uh, say, a, a fighting champion knows the ring. He knows the world from corner to corner. And uh, so at the beginning of my career, I had that pleasure of uh, traveling all over the world and being in his company. And uh, certainly the experience was invaluable. You're, of course, traveling at the moment with Herb Alpert, which is an instrumental group, but you're a vocalist, naturally. How do you find the European audiences reacting to your part of the act, which, of course, is all in English? Um, on the whole, very well. But I, the one problem, I think, is that uh, Herb and I draw an entirely different kind of audience. I think the, the people, those people who do buy my records in Europe and know them very well may not come to see her and vice versa. So that's that uh, sort of really that language barrier here in, in Europe. Something I've always wondered with an act like yours in which uh, the songs that you record are for the most part original things, that they're not standards, things like Little Green Apples and so forth. Does the song come first in your act and then you take it into the studios and get an orchestral arrangement of it or do the A&R men come to you with it and you, after you've recorded it, put it in the act? Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, it's, it depends, really. The company and I'm with uh, CBS here in Europe and Columbia in America. Um, I work with Jerry Fuller, who's my producer at Columbia, and uh, he and I um, think quite a lot alike about music, so we both search for songs. I don't have to do any one song. You know, I, uh, He looks for material um, that he thinks I might like, and uh, again, nine times out of ten, he's usually right, because as I said, we think quite a lot alike musically and uh, sometimes I start doing a song 
before the session, and off times uh, I learn it uh, maybe a week or two before the session, before the record session. Daddy's Little Man is the one that's on the charts right now, and we'd like to play that at this point for our weekend world audience. I wonder if you could give us a little of the background on Daddy's Little Man. Well, you were talking about sadness before and depression. Uh, the writer of that song, Mac Davis, uh, wrote the single that I had before Daddy's Little Man called Friend, Lover, Woman, and Wife. Mm -hmm. And this song told a very beautiful story. He was writing it for his wife, actually. And uh, he was obviously very much in love. And uh, about three or four months after he wrote the song and I recorded it, uh, they separated, you know, suddenly. And there was a little boy, and they had a little boy five years old, so he sat down and wrote Daddy's Little Man. And, uh, you know the story, that story. So. That's how it came to be. O.C. Smith, thank you very much, and we wish you well, certainly, on the rest of your tour of Europe. Good. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. This is Specialist Bill Swisher sending it back to Bob Moak and Weekend World.